as an outsider looking into it, perhaps before reading this book or looking into it much, it felt like the Marian dogmas, and pretty much all of them, were just entirely reliant upon tradition. That The Bible doesn't say a whole lot, but you've got these dogmas that people came up with over time, and that's kind of just how it is. That They're not in Scripture, but people thought it up, and then the Catholic Church dogmatized it. But mm-hmm. however, it seems you guys really are trying to work at this from the reverse. And so if someone out there is saying, hey, I want to look into this for myself, other than reading your book, which they should definitely do at the link in the description, um, if they're trying to make sense of the biblical arguments for the dogmas, what advice would you give them and where would you have them perhaps start with that? Well, I I did, because you were kind enough to help us um, by uh, prepping us here, I did provide some passages that could be helpful. Uh, the, uh, the, basically I, I, I put everything under the, um, the four dogmas, which are, uh, three of the four are common to all Orthodox and Catholic Christians. And then the Immaculate Conception is as a, a, a dogma, uh, uh, unique to, um, Catholicism as being, uh, uh, obligatory for its believers. So under those four headings, um, if we looked at the perpetual virginity, Luke one thirty four. And Luke 138 are really important passages. And those are the ones that take us back to Luke 11. Uh, With something like Bible Gateway or whatever you're using, if you have several different translations, you may be fortunate enough to take your Luke translation and line it up perfectly with Luke 134 and Luke 138 of Judges without having to go to any Greek or to entertain any of our arguments. And you just have to ask yourself, if there's even more parallels, because these are the most obvious, what what am I supposed to get out of this that Luke wants me to know where he's getting that from? And what am I supposed to get out of this story being related to the Annunciation? Why would he tell the story of the Annunciation through the eyes of Judges 11? And I'd be interested to see what alternative narratives you could come up with, if not the one that we came up with. Uh, the next one is on the title Mother of God, which is from the Council of, Cal- uh, of uh, Ephesus in 431. Uh, I would look at Luke 142. This is a puzzling passage where uh, Elizabeth weirdly ignores the incarnate Jesus who's there. We're, I mean, clearly John the Baptist can make his presence known in utero. He can say, hey, I'm here. He jumps in the womb. And Elizabeth, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, seemingly ignores Jesus, and, he, and she says, how is it the mother of my Lord should come here? So we're led under the Holy Spirit to know that there's this uh, way of talking about Mary called mother of the Lord. And I think that the, the major point of reflection here is, who is Elizabeth's Lord? Who is Elizabeth's Lord? Uh, would we say that whoever her Lord is, is God or is not? Uh, can we separate God from her Lord. If we always find ourselves coming back to the same thing, that Elizabeth's Lord is the Lord God, uh, then we can see that the next step is quite natural, mother of God, not mother of the Lord, but mother of God. So that that would be the the reflection passage uh, for the second Marian dogma. Uh, The third, which is the conception, the Immaculate Conception of Mary, um, we have really surprised ourselves. I did not expect to get into this at all in the book. Uh, Luke 1, verses 39 through 57. And the thing you want to concentrate on there is, can you make sense, if you have a good translation, which they're hard to come by. We were surprised how bad the translations are because of um, Reverend Dr. Brown and company being convinced that you can't read the past tense as a past tense. Uh, They all try to place it in the present tense or in the perfect have eaten, have done instead of ate or did something a long time ago. Um, but if you have a, if you have the past tense used there for the second and the third verbs in Mary's hymn, what does it mean that God a long time ago did great things for her sake, for her? Uh, and the other things that Mary says about what God did for her, how do you know when those were? What were those things? Uh, if Mary told you at you know, 12 years old that a long time ago, God did these great things for me. What are those things? Where do we get them? Uh, Why does she refer to them like we should know? Or at least 
uh, she's under the inspiration of the spirit to say them, uh, what's the corollary? And, and the point here that we're making is the context of the discussion is things that happen in wombs. And so our inference is maybe she's talking about her in utero life. Maybe she's talking about her in utero life. And the last thing is the assumption, and this is the hardest one. Uh, maybe eventually William and I will come up with a project on the assumption because I, I have to, I, I'll tell you, this is the one, if you're going to say it's all tradition, this is, I think, the, your, your best bet to try to pin down um, what I call historical Christians as being way too much into tradition and way too little into Bible, because it, the arguments are really typological. You have to argue first that Mary is the new ark, which I don't think is hard from our book, but just because she's new ark doesn't mean that she starts jetting up to heaven, uh, body and soul. Where do you get that from? And then uh, the next, the, the, the Old Testament passage, the chapter that's really important is 2 Samuel 6. Uh, Luke quotes 2 Samuel 6.10. But the, 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 ancient, the ancient fathers, when they first start talking about why Mary appropriately went up to heaven, uh, we see very early as uh, fifth century authors that they're, um, they're, they're referring to Psalm 132.8. Uh, Arise, O Lord, into the heavens, which is Christological prophecy. You and the ark of your strength. Oh, is there a second one that rises into the heavens? So, but you can see how typological that is. But if we accept the premise that the Lord needs to rise into the heavens, now we have to come up with an exegetical way to talk about what does it mean that the ark, if we're going to exclude Mary, what are we going to make the ark? And, you know, we could do anything with that. Uh, I have some ideas if I were a very convicted uh, non-Catholic uh, or non-Orthodox where I would go with that. I'm not going to share the secret. But, um, but I, th I think there are some exegetical strategies you can use. Um, but I think that the, the patristic literature in Jerusalem uh, saw that the best strategy here to use is that Mary, body, and soul goes to heaven. And that's all compared with Luke 1, 43. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate you taking the time to go through all of that. Uh, William, anything you want to add on that? Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, for people that are wondering, we, we, we definitely, we've talked about it in the future. We probably will definitely get a second edition out on that Mary book. Well, we probably will add to that particular issue of the Assumption of Mary. And I know that when dialoguing with Father, uh, we've talked about it, and there's definitely a lot of really incredible stuff in his mind when it comes to that. But <clears throat> I, I, to add one point to, to that, um, the book of Psalms, when I've looked at the early fathers and their interpretation, I find that a number of them indeed do make that connection of Mary, finding Mary in there. We can find John Damascene as well, uh, making that uh, very early connection and noting that others made that connection as well. So that I would add that point. I thought Fa Father was incredibly masterful in the way he um, connected through Scripture how we believe in these Mariological teachings. I completely agree with him. Uh, and I think that the one thing that I would add to that is each time ch church gathered in council, or when a dogmatic decree was laid down, the majority of the time was to attempt to squash a heresy, was not to create a dogma or to create something out of thin air. Indeed, even for the, the teaching of the Immaculate Conception, uh, theologians were, were dialogued with, the Pope dialogued with theologians, looked into the early church, looked at ancient interpretations, recognized that this had been a festival that had been celebrated from the ancient of times, and recognized that it was appropriate to make this a dogmatic teaching. So I would add that one point, that never in time has the church ever gathered and made something a teaching that was not believed by the faithful in a massive way um, in the early church. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that clip. I wanna say a real quick thank you to our sponsor today, Kindred. Kindred makes beautiful Bibles like this one with the goal of helping you reclaim sacred time with God in your daily life. Their goal is that through these beautiful Bibles that will cause you to read the Bible in a different way, that you'd read in a more reflective way, allowing you to encounter the Bible 
in a profound new way. It's been great for me and I know you're gonna enjoy it. They've been kind enough to provide me with a promo code that you can use to get 10% off your order. So go ahead and go to kindredapostle.com and use the promo code GOSPEL10 for 10% off your order today.